welcome to the first webinar of this year's Clark of the Irish Grassland Project. I am Paul Green and I'm the BSBI Island Officer. I'm covering Sarah Pierce while she's on maternity leave. Sarah Woods, the BSBI fundraising manager, is going to look after the IT behind the scenes and help with Q&A at the end. I'm going to talk about eight members of the Daisy family. Three hawkbits, three hawkbeards, a mouse ear hawkweed and cat's ears that occur in Irish grasslands. <coughs> and we're going to split the eight plants into three groups. <coughs> the first group we will look at has a rosette of leaves. The flower stem is topped by just a single flower and they are all perennial, so they live for many years. <coughs> And the first three are mouse ear hawkweed, lesser hawkbit, and rough hawkbit. And I've just put a note to remind me at the bottom that all the photos taken in this presentation, apart from one by Zoe Devlin, were all taken within the last two weeks, mainly from County Wexford, with a few from County Cork, Waterford, and, Tipper and Kilkenny. So, so in the eight plants are looking at. A leaf rosette is a radiating cluster of leaves at the base of the plant and they can sit flat to the ground as you can see in this picture on the left where my mouse is moving or they can stand upright. And when they stand upright they're not quite so obvious that they're a rosette but they, they still in the textbook mean would refer to that as a rosette of leaves. So mouse or hawkweed is the one I'm going to deal with first, because that's the one I'd like to think you'd better do or identify the easiest. Oh, slide for you. And this, they have pale yellow flowers, and that's the only one that really has pale yellow. So all the others, as you can see in the background in this picture, tend to have deep yellow or golden yellow flowers. So mouse ear hawkweed is the easiest of the eight to identify as there are several features that the other seven don't have. It's the only one to have stolons, so that's these creeping stems. You see the stem creeping here over the ground and then they will root at the end. So this stem here will send out a root here and that will form a new plant and in time those stems then die away and then that plant gradually spread and spread and form a great big patch. And it tends to like to grow in short grassland, so it's, might be, you might see it on a lawn or in a churchyard, but then it can be quite common in, on limestone grassland where there's not quite so much competition. And the leaves are more distinctive than this one than any of the other seven species. <coughs> they're green on the upper surface, you can see here, they're nice and green. And then on the underside, they're white. And they have what I call like a, almost like a, white cotton wool effect they're really sort of woolly close to the surface of the leaf and then they have lots of long straight hairs so that so the leaves can look really hairy at times one of the features i find on most of the mouse ear hawkweeds in ireland they have many glandular hairs on the flower stalk and up on the flower head so you see all these little yellow glands here and, that, that, and they're like if you know what a sundew looks like and where the insects land on the leaf of the sundew and get stuck to the leaf these are like that but they're not sticking quite the same way so the insects don't get stuck to them so you see all these little yellow glands down here and they're like it's like a bit like a blob of glue stuck to the end, end of, a, of a hair but they don't really have that much of a function so as, as I said earlier, the, the flowers are pale, pale yellow and on the underside they are red. And this is only on the outer ray florets or petals. When I say outer ray florets, that means all these ones sticking out around the edge of the flower. They're the outer ray florets and all the others you would refer to as inner ray florets. 
So this this is where it gets difficult because from now on, none of these plants have ever read any of the botanical books because you find the field guides, it doesn't matter whether the field guide is written just for Irish plants and, and there's an Irish based book or it's one that covers Britain and Ireland. Not a single one of them has any of the facts completely correct for any of these next seven yellow species. And partly that is because they're so variable. I don't know if it's in Ireland that we just, because we've been separated from, by, from Britain by the sea for a long time, that they've evolved slightly different, but I find it, the descriptions are very misleading. It, if you're talking about the height of the plant, most books like will say for this plant, it grows to 40 centimeters, but you, and you go out with your root and you find they grow to 60, and they can be hairy or not hairy, and the books will only mention one form. So it's just something to remember when you're, when you're using textbooks, it don't, they aren't always correct. And I have lots of books at home and, I, and I've been reading them all the last few days and I kept thinking, oh, that one says something different to that one. So in, in Leontidons, the hairs are forked. So these, there's only this one and the next species that has forked hairs. So they're like the letter Y. So you can see down here, you've got a, a straight stalk and then two branches at the top. So, so we call those forked hairs. You see all over the leaf here, you can see these little Y's. And you'll find, if you, you probably need to get a hand lens out to see, see, see the hairs are forked, but you find almost every hair on the plant is forked, but you occasionally get the odd plant where a few of the hairs aren't. So as so long as you can find it, you've got a forked hair, you know you've got a Leontid on. And the rough hawk bit is a very hairy plant. So the whole plant, you see the flower bud here is hairy, all the way up the stem is hairy. And the leaves are very hairy on the underside where my cursor is moving. And they're also hairy on the top. The hairs on the top of the leaf are much shorter. And the leaves are also lobed. You can see how they're sort of crinkly with all these lobes and these lobes up here. And then down here you see the lobes. So, and that tends to be quite uniform. They tend to be reasonably similar looking from it for each plant. But one of the best characters, before it starts flowering, all the flowering stems droop as in this, these pictures. And then before they're, just before they're about to sort of get ready to actually open up and show the petals, this, the, they stand upright. And this one has gray on the underside of the petals. So the outer ray florets are gray. You see they're gray, gray here. And then sort of just pick up the gray over here. And all, all the plants are looking at tonight tend to have a swollen just below the flower bud. You can see here, but this one's the most distinctive. So I put this in just to show what, what books mean. So you can really see that the stem is sort of parallel all the way up and suddenly it has a, a, a swollen base. So lesser hawk bit. This is an incredibly variable plant, but it likes to grow in where there's not too much competition. So this photo was taken on June, June grassland. And you can see they're quite tiny plants. You see these tiny little leaves. And these are all the all these flowers are belong to it. But it also likes to grow in limestone grassland, so you can find it mixed in with rough hawk bit and some of the other species we'll see in a minute. And you might find it growing in churchyards and on lawns, but always where there's, the grass is reasonably short. This one has forked hairs again, but they tend to be red bases. So all, all the eight plants are looking at tonight, if you look really carefully with a hand lens, you see all the hairs have a swollen base to them. And in this plant, this is the only one in the, of the eight, they, they tend to be red at the base. So as I walk along, I can look down and think, oh, that plant's got um, a red base to the, to the stem, <coughs> or the, not the stem, I mean, to the, to the hair. <coughs> so you, and then if you get your hand lens and look for the forked hairs, you know you've got lesser hawk bit. So it's quite a good identification feature throughout the year. And I've got a selection of leaves here just to show how variable they are because these all come from a population and we're all in about 10 meters of each other. 
and the leaves all seem so different from plant to plant. So you see this leaf here, it's just got a few lobes along the edge. And, and like this one here, it's just a few lobes. And then this one here has got the really, really big lobes. And then the others vary somewhere in between. And the smallest plant, all the leaves are four centimetres or shorter, so really tiny. And the biggest plant, plant in the population had leaves up to 27 centimetres, this one here. So that's, that's quite a comparison in size. See, in most books, say the leaves don't grow any bigger than 20 centimetres. So here I've got two, two plants to show how different they look. So on the left, you've got all the leaves sitting flat to the ground, forming a circle. These are, are usually small plants. That rosette would probably be perhaps five to six centimetres across, and the flower stems would probably only be 10 centimetres tall. And that's what I think, that's how I think of this plant. That's, that's what you're most likely to see it like. But you also get the plants on the right, and they have all these upstanding leaves and, flat, and tall flower stems, but they tend to be coastal. So I've seen this all the way along the coast from Wexford into Cork, up into um, Wicklow, and then up on the coast of Mayo. But I've also seen it on limestone grass. And so these big plants don't seem to match the descriptions of any of the books, because they seem to be much bigger than all the books say they should be. So, so when you're out there looking, if you see a plant on the left, like the picture on the left, that's how you expect it. But they're also quite common as big bushy plants. A lesser hawk, but can also have a drooping bud, but it's not, they don't always, but that's, I just thought that was quite a nice picture. And it shows how hairy the stem is. So this stem is hairy all the way up. But a more typical Irish plant would only have hairs halfway up. The rest of the stem would be completely hairless. And usually about 15 centimeters long, this stem. But you find the field guides give you a range of 25 to 40 as maximum. But I, I find over here the flowering stems often grow up to 47 or 50, or sometimes even a bit bigger. And that's where you can get caught out with the books because the books you think, oh, you measure the flower stalk, and, oh, this must be something different. So it's longer than the books say. And you find with these smaller plants, the leaves are really, really hairy. Ooh. And here we're looking at the involucral bracts, that these these hair, hairy bits. So, and in, in other plants, that's what you probably would refer to as a sepal. And they can be hairy, as you see here on where my cursor is, so, or hairy or hairless, or somewhere in between. So you see these two here. One's hairy, and the other hasn't got hair in this, in this, anywhere on it. And usually they are grayish purple on the underside. That's how I was taught to spot this one, look for the grayish purple on the underside of the rayed florets. But as you see in these ones, they're pink. So again, it's just, um, you've got to be careful because they can be vary from plant to plant. And, and these were from the same population. But, but in lesser hawk, the seeds are the things you need to look for. If you, if you can find the seeds, you, you can't go wrong with the identification. So on the left, we just got a picture showing the nice fluffy head and they're getting ready to blow away in the wind. And each dry fruit is called an akin. So each of these dark colored fruits are akins or these paler ones. They just haven't got ripe yet. And the, all the inner ones sit on what looks like this honeycomb here in the middle. They all have these papas on the top, the fluffy bits, and they will blow away in the wind. Where this, the outer row of seeds, that's these here, they have like a fluffy crown or like a bit like paper on the top, and they're tucked right into the involucral bracts, almost they sit in the groove, and you have to almost pull the involucral bracts right off to be able to find these. <coughs> but this is the only plant of the eight we're looking at tonight, and I think the only one, only member of the Yellow Daisy family that does this. So if you can find those, you know you've definitely got lesser hawk bit. 
but you just have to remember they actually sit so tight in there. If you don't look carefully, you just don't, don't see them. <coughs> so the next two species have rosettes of leaves, leaf, leafless stems that are branched, and they can be branched quite a few times. <coughs> and these are both perennials, and they both can live for quite a long time. And they are autumn hawkbit with scorchinoides autumnalis or cat's ear hypercaris radicata. <coughs> and if you have a, a flower book which was probably printed before 2012, the Latin name will probably be Leontodon autumnalis. <coughs> but th this is the only, only one that we're doing tonight, which had a name change in recent years. This one normally flowers. Usually, I, would, I think of more late July, so I was quite surprised to see these flowering last week. And this, this is the only population I've seen flowering this year so far. <laughs> this, I put these leaves because this is what I think of as a typical autumn hawkbit: very dissected leaves, really dissected and hairy. So that's how I like to think of a plant. But again, it comes in many varieties. You, you see in this picture here, the leaves here have no hairs on, but they're still very low, but they're completely hairless. These ones here have no lobes and are hairless. And this one is green and hairless. <coughs> but what I find it tend, tends to be what habitat they're growing. So the drier the habitat, more lobes the leaves tend to be and in the wetter habitats they don't have any lobes on at all and the leaves can sit flat to the ground as in the picture on the left or on this green one is actually standing upright so so they, the leaves can vary and this it's quite hard to describe this plant because it's it's it comes in so many forms and varieties and you have different subspecies and different varieties that grow in different habitats And it always has leaves when it's flowering, so it has nice bushy leaves. So they can, as, as in the early pictures, the le leaves can sit flat to the ground or they can sort of stand upright. And on this one on the left, you've got the, fl the flower stalk here and it's just branched twice, one branch there and then another branch going up there. <clears throat> and the picture on the right, you've got a flower stalk. This is the main lead flower stalk. And then it's branched once here again here and again here. So that branch is branched twice and then ended up branched three times. You've got one more branch here, another branch here. <clears throat> and these, these stems can be very branched and occasionally unbranched, but usually they have at least one, one branch on. And the outer row of ray florets are usually red. You can just sort of see the red in the picture taken here by, by Zoe Devlin. But they can be sort of have just a hint of red or they can be just yellow. But the, the red form is the sort of more the commoner variety. And the involucal bracts can be hairless as in, in Zoe's picture or they can be very hairy. And, that, that, and you can sometimes have the, on the same plant, you can have a hairy head and a non-hairy one. So they, they, they can vary just in, within one plant. And you usually find, not always, they have little little ears. You see these little ears here. Like, they're like little leafy flaps, bracts up the flower stalk, but they tend to only be up in the top part of the flower stalk. So about three to four centimeters below the flower. And you don't usually get any any lower. So, so cats here, <coughs> Hypercaris radicata. This, this picture, nearly every yellow flower you can see in it is cats here. I've never seen a site where there's been so much cats here. And this was our, our first field trip as part of the Irish Grassland Project last week down in Donnerail in County Cork. <coughs> and, and, the, and the flower meadows are, ju are just stunning. So 
So, so a, a typical leaf of a cactus, they sit, usually sit flat to the ground. So you see these are sitting nice and flat, they're hug, hugging, hugging the stones. And the leaves usually have, have, have lobes. So these ones here, see they're all nice and crinkly all the way down the edge, all up here. And that's how I think of a cactus. That's what I think of a typical cactus leaf. And, and it has unbranched hair, so all the hairs are straight and they're hairy on both sides. You, you see where this leaf on this edge, you can see it's really white and hairy. And I've been told this is why it's called cat's ear, because if you rub those hairs, they're nice and soft, like the ear of a cat. But occasionally you'll find plants have no lobes to the leaves. But as I've mentioned earlier, Irish plants don't, don't like to read the textbooks. So the stems are usually branched at least once. And you see the plant on the left, it's got four branches. So this is the main stem all the way up, up to the top lead flower. And it's got one branch right at the top of the stem. And then it's got another branch coming up here. And it's got another, another branch here. And then this branch here is branched once, twice, and so it's got three branches on and that's quite typical and those, those stems can be anything up to a meter tall and then you can see again on this one here this is the main lead stem and it's got one straight branch here another branch here and then one branch here and when i was looking at this side this is a, a church, churchyard grassland every flower stalk i looked at had at least one branch on and then there was one single straight stem with not a single branch anywhere so it's so occasion very occasionally they, they don't have a branch but that seems to be quite uncommon and, it, and if you cut the grass i've noticed the cats here it takes about two weeks for these stems to grow to flower so that they, so they grow quite at quite a fast rate something i only learned um this week when i was taking photos the stems can be hairy at the base. You see, you see all the hairs, especially down lower down. But some of the books do say they can have hairy stems. So, um, but usually the stems are completely hairless. And the stems also have all these little bracts, like the autumn hawk bit. And they tend to go all the way down the stem. So they, go, as, and they, they tend to get a bit more sparse as you get lower down to the rosette, but they tend to be all the way. And some plants have big ears, like you see in this um, picture, so they're really obvious. And other plants, you have to almost look with a magnifying glass to find them. <clears throat> and this is another reason I, I've been told why it's called cat's ear, because it has these little ears, and these are meant to represent the ear of a cat. So, so again, you, you, you can look at the um, underside of the outer row of ray florets, and they're usually greyish, but can be red or even purple. So this is sort of somewhere between red and purple, and that's quite purple. And sometimes they're just completely yellow. <coughs> and each involucral bract is red, no purple tipped, I'm meant to say. So you see, you see they're purple, and that seems to be quite diagnostic. I've noticed most, nearly all cats here have, have those purple tips. And then you have this crest of hairs or up here. You can see this crest, and they they remind me of if you go back to the seventies when the punks had a spiky hair. And that's, so I think of this as the punk of the um, yellow daisy family. And that seems to be quite diagnostic. I mean, they are hairs, but they're really stiff. So you actually look like more like a crown or a crest. We have three, three more species to deal with. And these have a rosette, but usually by the time they start flowering, the rosette has died down completely, or in some cases. And they, they can be tall, leafy branch stems. So they, they might be a meter and a half tall and have lots of leaves. And they tend to be annual, so they're flower and fruit and die in one year, or they're biannuals and they live for two years. And these are smooth hawk's beard, beaks hawk's beard, and rough hawk's beard. And 
So smooth hawksbeard, Crepa capillaris, it likes growing in grassland, but it's, it's also quite common on waste ground and other rough areas. And this picture here was growing as a weed in an oat field. And these, these are usually annual, so they come up and flower and die and fruit all in one year, so they, they get it over and done with quite quickly. <laughs> and the, when they're, while they're flowering, they still usually have their rosettes. You can just see the rosette of leaves here on this plant sitting on the wall. And it, they come in sort of two, two forms. You get a short form, doesn't have many branches, as this picture on the left. And that's what I'd, I'd say about half the populations you see are that like that. They tend to be in what, sort of the more drier habitat, so like on a wall or on a bank. And then you get plants like the one on the right, where they can be big and bushy and have many branches. And they, and they look sort of quite different, even though they are actually the same species. And, and the stems could be either green, like the picture on the left, or, or red. And you find the bigger plants are tall. They can be 80 to 120 centimetres tall. So they're, they're quite tall. And often that means people misidentify them for another species because they're bigger than the books. With most books imply they only grow to 80, perhaps 90 centimetres. Now the leaves, I usually have a few hairs just on the midrib. When I say on the midrib, I mean down this main centre vein in the middle of the leaf. Usually more on the underside, but also on the upper surface. And occasionally like, the leaves will be hairy all over. As a rule, they aren't. And the leaves can vary from one plant to another or even on the same plant. So these were taken from three different plants growing together. One plant only had leaves with no lobes like this one here on the left. <coughs> Another plant had them where they had all these lobes in the lower half and then the top part you just had no lobes. And, it, and another plant, all the leaves were really dissected and had really long narrow lobes. And that was just in three different plants growing next to each other. So it just shows you how, how hard <coughs> trying to describe what the leaves are like. And the leaves will be quite small or quite big and some plants have lots of leaves and other plants only have, have a few. So the outer row of Ray Florets can either be yellow, cream, or red on the underside, but red is the most common. So like, like this one here, you see the nice and red, they can be cream and occasionally just yellow. But books normally say they're red on the underside. When they're, when they're in bud, the buds are parallel sided. And as, as, the, as the petal starts to emerge, the head sort of takes shape and starts to swell a bit. This is the seeds form. So you see these are sort of like almost straight sided. <clears throat> and that's because the um, seeds are, are still developing in there. And as they start growing and swelling up, they push it in the leucobrax out. So it starts looking swollen at the base. And then you get this sort of comb like at the top. That's where the, the seeds the, of the fluffy papus bits are sitting. So these are called flask shape, and that's quite important to remember because that makes, once they get the heads are developed enough, they have this distinctive shape, so they what we call flask in botany terms. And the outer row of infralucal bracts normally sit quite tight to, to the inner, so they, they aren't really that obvious they're there. And the flower stalks are usually hairy, as you see, see in both these pictures. And I've put these two in, because these were two plants from the same population. And the plant on the left has all these glandular hairs all over, over the involucral bracts. 
but in this case they've got yellow, um, no not yellow, pale translucent blobs of glue on the, on the top of the stalks. And then the picture on the left, there's not a single glandular hair anywhere. <coughs> and they, they um, just have um, black based hairs and white tipped. So, so it's a real contrast from one head to another. And just another good example how how variable all these plants are. And the seeds are ribbed. You can just about make out my picture here, the raised lines on the seeds. <coughs> And then they have a, they have a white pappus on the top, like you think of a dandelion, to blow them away in the wind. But just remember that shape of that shape of that head, that flask shape, because that's quite quite important. So beaks, hawk's beard, crepus visicaria. This is the only one we. It's definitely non-native in Ireland. This is, but it's still a very common common plant, and it's definitely spreading. It's now quite common along many of the wide grassy verges along sort of the motorways and dual carriageways and some of the main roads. And, and, and this was all through the grassland. This is down on the coast in Waterford. And these usually have a rosette of leaves. <coughs> while they're flowering. <coughs> and something, I, even though I haven't read it in the books, I don't even realize this week. These flat, um, all these yellow um, daisy family, or the, or the eight we're talking about at least, they all go to sleep at night. Well, I don't mean they lay their head on a pillow. <coughs> they all close their flowers up. So it must mean they're um, all um, pollinated by day flying insects. This photo here of the yellow flowers <coughs> was taken at 10 past seven yesterday morning. You can just see the flowers are starting to open out and by eight o'clock they are flat topped. The beet hawk's beard is usually an annual but can also be a biannual. And the le le leaves are usually lobes. You see this picture on the left, it's got nice lobe leaves. And the leaves can be covered in little white hairs, as you see down here on this picture. But they're all they're quite short and, and the leaves vary quite a lot. Some leaves are really quite hairy and other leaves are almost hairless. So again, it, it varies from plant to plant. So it's always worth just having, when you're looking at a population, have a look at several plants, to see how much they vary. And then you can you know, find one of them will match the description in the book. Now, now this, this is the important part of this plant. It's, it's the fl flower head <coughs> and the outer ray florets are usually red on the underside so you can see these lovely red on the underside of the petals and I find most plants generally do that so that usually works as quite a good character to look for and the infralucral bracts are often grey as they're covered in a fine silk and it's almost like imagine a spider's run all over the over the Involucral bracts and left its silk trail behind. It makes, because they're not really hairs, they're like just like silk laying all over, over the surface. And you can sort of just rub, rub them off. And then you get plants like this one here on the right, where they don't have any, any silky hairs at all. And the involucral bracts are hairy and usually have many, have glandular hairs. You see all the glandular hairs, all these little spots. Heads. And that's what I find most of them tend to be like, but not always. Again, it, they don't, they never, all, not all plants are identical. And they usually have hairs on the stalk, but this one's not that hairy. And then this one's covered in silky hairs and hairs. <coughs> so again, it can, it can be very, very variable. But, but on this one, the outer row of infralucral bracts tend to be held at right angles to the, to the, inner infralucal bracts. So you can really see how they 
bend outwards. And, that, and I find that's quite a good character because it's it's once you get that get used to it, it's quite distinctive. And then when when it's in seed, see how different shape this seed head is. It's almost parallel sided. And that's because the fruits have a beak, what we'll look at it shortly. <clears throat> so it has quite a different shape head. So once you get the hang of it, you can normally pick the head out compared to that smooth hawk's bit what has the um flash like head. So it's the, the seeds are really the diagnostic feature of beaked hawk's hawk's beard. So you've got the seed down here at the bottom, and that's that's a bit will grow into the new plant. And then it has this great big long beak. And the beak is normally the same length as this as the seed. And then you have the fluffy Pappas at the top to blow it away in the wind. And that's the only one of all the eight we're looking at where has a great big long beak. Some of the others have a tiny beak, what you almost need a magnifying glass to look at. So long as long as you wait till they get this one gets to seed, that beak makes it obvious which species you're looking at. And I just put here for comparison, smooth hawk's beard with, without a beak. And you can just about see the ribs on the seeds seeds here. <coughs> so it's a long so you, long as you can find the seeds, this one you shouldn't have any problem identifying. <coughs> now rough rough hawks beard, Crappus biennis. They're not sure if this one's actually native to, to Ireland, but if if it's native, it's been or not native, it's certainly been around for a long time. But it's definitely on the on the increase. It's now common on the motorway from Dublin up to Belfast. And, and all the sites I've seen in Wexford, they've all come in with grass seeds. So it's definitely coming in the grass seed contaminant. And this whole field was nearly all the yellow. It's, it's rough hawk's beard. And this, was, this was an amazing site. This was at Thomastown in County Kilkenny last week. And it's, I've rarely ever seen the, a whole field covered in it. This one is a biennial, so it sends has a rose out of leaves. The, the, this was taken last week, <coughs> and, the, and the leaves are softly hairy on both sides, and the rosette leaves, <coughs> and, they, and they tend to have these downturned lobes. You see, they're like they're sort of curved, where nearly all the others have right lobes are held at right angles. So that that's quite a good feature to identify these. And the, and the center midrib tends to be red, so you, it sort of sta stands out. And by the time, the, the time this plant starts flowering next year, those, those leaves will have died away. <coughs> and I've put this picture in here on the left because it shows how hairy the, the stem is. It's hairy at the bottom, and then as you go up, the hairs get less and less and less. By the time you get to the top, it's usually sort of hairless. And the stems vary in redness quite a bit. So this one, you can just about pick out the red down here at the base. And the plant on the left is red all the way up, up the stem. And you can also see there's no rosette leaves down here. The rosette leaves are completely dyed as this plant's flowering. And as you go up the stem, the leaves tend to only have hairs on the margins or along the veins of the leaves. And as you get higher and higher up the plant, the leaves get less and less hairy. So again, you, you have to look at a selection of leaves on, on the one plant just to see how much they vary because books might say they're hairy, but that, that just depends where in the plant you look. <coughs> and you find most plants are generally 1.2 meters tall or even bigger. I mean, they can be about two meters tall in the exceptional circumstances. And the flowers are, 40, are up to 45 millimeters across when fully open. <coughs> so this has the largest flowers of the eight species we've looked at tonight. And when I say across, I mean when they're fully flat, you just measure from one side across to the other side. <coughs> and this one tends to be a bit more distinctive when it's flowering because the petals don't overlap that much. You can see there's great big gaps in between each 
each petal, where all, all the other petals more or less overlap. So that you can use that as a diagnostic character to identify this one. And again, the fruits are, have ridges on and they're not beet, but they, have, and they still have the fluffy pappus so they can blow away in the wind. And I've put a selection of, of heads, just showing the outer involucral bracts. As they are much broader than the other two hawk beards. So you can see they're quite, they're quite broad. And they can be quite long. So this, you've got one here is almost up to the top of the bud. So, so they vary in length, but they're, they're big and broad. So they, they really stand out. When you, when you, once you get the hang of this plant, you, you see those outer involucral bracts and it's almost diagnostic character. You can usually use it to name the plant. And the in, in, inner involucral bracts can be, have just a few black hairs as on this bud, or it can be really hairy. So again, like all the others, it's quite a, a variable plant. And finally, if you have a garden, they, they grow, most of them grow quite easily. And as you can see down here, I've got a pot of um, rough hawk, hawk spit. Because this is one I was having problems with identifying. So I, I collected these seeds from Ross Common last year. And I also grow them in the garden because they're fantastic for the um, um, insects. And also the goldfinches and the linux like raiding the seeds so that they're really good for wildlife but if you do grow them in the garden they're all quite nice but they can get a bit out of control especially the, the hawk, hawk beards they really can sort of multiply like at super fast rates and before we take any questions i just got a member to thank national parks and wildlife service again for sponsoring this talk and funding my job um, Sarah Woods for operating in the background and making sure it all worked nicely. <coughs> Sharon Spratt for advertising and organising this event. Zoe Devlin for lending me a picture. And, and a friend, Vera, for letting me use her internet because my internet stopped working today. So um, <laughs> we, we, we've been saved. <laughs> so if you, if, is there any questions? Hi. Sarah. Oh, yes. Thank you. That was fantastic. I hope I can say that on behalf of everyone. And um, we've got a couple of questions. Um, so there was one from N. Sweeney who asks, in general, does the one species grow together in a population? Given their variability, can you look at a number of plants growing beside each other without a change in habitat type to try and ID them? I think as you were saying, you know, the leaves can be so varied. Can you, can you kind of look across a population to try and find some of these aspects that you're talking about? Yeah, so so if you if you if you're being a, a good botanist, I would look at a selection of plants in each population, so you get more the average of what a plant would be like. So, if you're looking at the leaves, look at two or three plants, or say five or six, and and you better see that some plant leaves might be lobed, some aren't. So, so you generally just look at a good selection because I do find that's the problem. You can have two plants next to each other. It's hard to believe they're both smooth hawk's beard, for example. So yeah, do, do take a good good look at a population. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Hannah asks, is Crepus biennis the only one that the leaves die off of when it's flowering? That's the only one what does it 100%, it always does that. The others, it really depends how dry the, the se season is, but Crepus biennis always does it. So you send up a rose out of leaves, sort of about now they start growing and then but they're, they're still there when the flower stem starts to grow but they sort of wither away sort of in even a, April or May but all, all the others usually have a, a rose of leaves at flowering and, and the, the, the hawk bits and hawk oh, I forgot what they all are now the, the names are too similar always keep their leaves all year round so, so they're in, in theory they're evergreen most the um Leontodons and that they're actually evergreen plants. Okay, thank you. Um, Ruth asks, do you have any recommendations for online keys or books? She's using Francis Rose at the moment. I just had a quick check and there's no specific BSBI crib sheet for these. Uh, so do you have any other recommendations? Yeah, I, um, 
Yeah, Francis Rose is is a very a very good book. So it co covers the wall and has a, what I call good diagrams. I think it's one of the if you're a beginner, it shows what it tends to show what you need. But there is, um, I think, I was told I haven't seen it because I, I didn't just didn't have enough time today to look. Faith Ansley has a on her website a guide to yellow members of the daisy family. But I've been told I haven't looked, so I don't. But as far as I know, she has. But my, my internet crashed there, so I just didn't have, didn't have time to look. But generally, um, you, and, and then you've got, you got websites. I mean, there's Zoe Devlin's got a great website, and she has pictures of nearly all the plants we looked at tonight. So, so yeah, if you use, I, I, I don't know if there's any book what I would recommend solely for them, because I in the last um, few days, I've been looking at so many different books, just reading them, think, oh, this one says it has a hairy leaves, this one says they're hairless, and so, so there's, there's no book I would recommend 100%. Even um, Webb's Floor of Ireland, half, some of the time, I didn't really quite agree with what they said said in there. So uh, you really, if, if, if I'm honest, you, you need to use a selection of books just so you get a, a broad sense of what the plant could be like. So you might, and, and then if you use some of the websites, like, like I mentioned, Zoe Devlin's, there's always really good pictures, so that and that's can be very very useful. And you, if you use a website like Zoe, you know the plant's name correct. Where if you just type the name into the website, into the internet, and ask for for rough hawks, but you don't know if all the pictures you're looking at are actually the right species because they quite often are wrong. So so do do be careful if you're just asking the internet broadly for for pictures of of a species. Perfect, thanks Paul. I've just had a look for face, but I can't see anything particular. So perhaps there's something drifting out there, but um, I'm sure if we find anything, we can put it in the description of the YouTube video when this one goes up. So if you find something, you can post it there. Um, Joe just asked, will this be available as a recording? So yes, it will It'll be going up on, on YouTube once we've um, done a little bit of editing and, and got that all ready. So we'll make sure that that's all up there. And then Anne asks, um, where is uh, Prepis Vesicaria native to? <laughs> testing you right at the end i i don't i don't know actually without if i if i'm honest i, I presume it's um main, mainland europe but I, I i can't remember reading that and i haven't got any books books in front of me so i can't no i, I don't know off by hand if i'm honest but i presume it's main, mainland europe so um But I mean, I mean, I know it's been in Ireland since about the 1880s, so it's been here about 120 years now. But it's, it's definitely spreading at quite quite an alarm rate. So I used to think it was as a rare plant. Now it's almost an everyday plant when I go out. So it's in because I've lived in Ireland or been botanized in Ireland for 20 years, and the, the distribution has really changed on it. So, um, and whether that's to do with climate change or the population just got big enough, so it's it's common now. But I. When you're out, out of, especially when you're out and about in Wexford and Waterford, it's a really common plant now. So, um, and when I did the water, um, recording of Waterford 10 years ago, I, I thought it was a rare plant. So it just shows in sort of 10 years how plants can, populations can really change. Thanks, Paul. I think that's all the questions we've had so far. If anyone else has any questions, please do just pop them in the Q&A or the chat um, and we'll try and get to them. But that was fantastic. Did you go out at... 10 in the morning at uh, 10 past seven in the morning to get them closed on purpose no i i i just um I, i've been so busy the last week that i, I needed the photo so i thought let, let's let's get level oh, I'm, I'm up let's get go I'd, I'd spent an hour already putting the presentations together and so i thought oh it's it's daylight the sun's just high enough so i went out to get the photos and i i, I had to move i had to move the car because the, the building was coming in at eight o'clock so um but, but then, then I found when I got to one population, for the, the, the sun hadn't quite got high enough, so there was a little hill in the way, so um, I couldn't take the photos I wanted. But <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and just to point out, I will just put a link to them in the chat, but we have got some other trainings coming up um, on this project and um, in general. There's an aquatics plant project going on at the same time in Ireland, and we've got some trainings coming up for that as well. So um, the website is always the best resource for anyone who's... Um, uh, looking for anything that's coming up. Uh, there's a question from Jim who says, 
he, he just missed the start of the presentation. What were the first three species? Name names only. He joined um, when you were describing uh, so conoroides. So I don't know if you can go back through your slides or just to the top. But um, as he said, those ones will be on the recording. But we can just give Jim that. We go rough hawks bit, lesser hawks bit. And mouse ear hawkweed. Mouse hawk, yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. So we started with mouse ear hawkweed, then rough hawk's beard, and then lesser hawkweed. Yeah, I, I get confused. I these plants, I, I, it's almost easier to use Latin names because I get confused which ones are hawk bits and which ones are hawkweed because they're so similar names and the spellings aren't that different either. And I, I was out with some botanists in Laos the other week. And by the time they said, oh, why is that one a hawk's bin and why is that a hawk weed? And I thought, oh, I, I got so confused. I said, I, I don't know. I just know that they're called a hawk's beard and a hawk's bit. But when people start asking, why is one that? It's, 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 it's not easy. So um, so, so if, if you're good, you should really you, you try and make an effort to use Latin names. But m m lots of us don't. And I, I'm, I'm one of those naughty bottoms. I, I think in English names, but I just use Latin name, names. Well, I'm, when I've, I'm with other botanists, so. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I don't think there are any other questions. There are a lot of people saying how much they enjoyed it, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, unless there are any other last minute questions. I mean, uh, if, I mean if, if, pe if people want, I don't, I don't mind, as long as you don't swamp me, I don't mind receiving photos to help with ID. You can get hold of me at paul.green at bsbi.org. But, but just send a few photos, not not hundreds. So um brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Um and Zoe says, any chance of another webinar on yellow brassicas? <laughs> Getting requests now. <laughs> um, they, they, they don't go and grow in grasslands, so uh, <laughs> but we yeah, we, we we could look into that for later in the year. Brilliant. Great. Fantastic. Um, thanks everyone for coming along. And thank you, Paul, for, for hosting and doing such a great job and such great photos um, and insight. Um, and I think we'll leave it there and say have a lovely evening, everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you.